Um, so, um, let's see. There's our offsets due next week. There was a discussion that we, some of us had uh, at Monday's problem session regarding the first problem and the classical uh, description of the energy shift associated with um, the interaction of electromagnetic um, wave interacting with a dipole with a charge on a spring. And uh, thinking about it a bit more, the way the problem is described is not quite correct. That really, that, that energy shift only makes sense in thinking about it in time average. And it's that which is the comparable uh, entity compared to the light shift that you get in the quantum mechanical description, which is part of the purpose of this problem to relate these two things. Um, and that time averaging is equivalent to what we see in the rotating wave approximation. Remember, the rotating wave approximation was essentially time averaging the interaction and the rapidly oscillating terms that we removed. So it's really only the time average that we want in there and the other term, which doesn't really make sense. Okay. All right. Um, so let's see. Yesterday, or Monday, I should say, we were talking about a very important uh, problem. Uh, we want to include in our description of the interaction of atoms and fields spontaneous emission, which will, even if we removed all other technical sources of noise and dissipation, we are we have the fundamental. Uh, the fundamental dissipation that arises due to spontaneous emission. And this is part of a description that's broader about um, open quantum systems. Okay? So what do we mean by open quantum system? Well, here what we have is some kind, our two-level atom, We have our two-level atom, which we are potentially, we are say, driving with our electromagnetic uh, wave, which we discuss causes Rabi oscillations between the ground and excited state. But in addition, we know that the excited state, due to its coupling to the vacuum, has a finite lifetime and therefore can decay via spontaneous emission back to the ground state. And that photon is lost and, and flies away. And in doing so, we, we then have uh, a system which is coupled to, if you like, a bath or a reservoir of other electromagnetic modes, which are, not, are no longer part of our description. And in that sense, the system is open to the environment. And we're not keeping track of all of those other environmental what happens in that circumstance is that we lose information. Information about the state of the system is lost. And it's lost to, in this case, the um, vacuum modes of the electromagnetic field. So we want to have a description of that that's a little bit more general, actually a lot more general, than our basic description in terms of a Schrodinger equation with a Hamiltonian and a unitary evolution operator. So that's quite an involved subject. We, we, there's a lot to build up in, in, in to truly derive how one starts from microscopic laws, which are time reversal invariant and unitary to a description which involves dissipation 
and irreversible dynamics. So we're just here going to talk about some of the, the most important uh, basic features of that. Um, the first thing that we discussed related to that last time was the idea that if I have a finite lifetime, then as understood from the time energy uncertainty principle, that state no longer has a well-defined energy. It has a line width. We'll talk about that a little bit more detail today. And that line width can be accounted for by uh, modifying our Hamiltonian to a, a kind of effective Hamiltonian with the eigenvalue associated with that unstable energy level being modified to have an imaginary part related to the finite lifetime. So gamma here is a finite lifetime. One over the lifetime is the rating of decay. Okay? So we have now an effective Hamiltonian for the system involving the atom and the interaction with the field. And if we use that in our Schrodinger equation for the probability amplitudes for our two level system, then we get a Schrodinger equation for those evolutions, which is no longer unitary. In, because it has these imaginary terms in the eigenvalues, this Hamiltonian is not permission. So this evolution is not unitary. Um, now this description can't really describe the full two-level description because the, it's because it's not unitary then the, what, what defines a unitary operator or unitary matrix? What defines a unitary operator or unitary matrix is that it preserves the inner product. That's the definition of unitary. But that, what, if I have an evolution that is not unitary, then the inner product is not preserved. So what that means is if I look at the norm squared, which is the inner product of a vector with itself, that norm will not be preserved. And therefore, the probability to uh, be in one of these states won't sum to one. Now, that might be OK if there were a third level around, and population just went to that third level, and we just weren't keeping track of that third level. That, that would be what we would call in the jargon, a non-trace preserving map. Why it's called trace preserving, we'll say in a moment. But if we really have two level system like this, where there's a population only in one of these two levels, this is not the full description. And as we discussed the last time, the reason for that is that um, this kind of description doesn't account for some of the other dynamics that we know occur, which is that if we were to look for the photon out here, then in a random stochastic manner, we would see clicks. That is a phenomenon that exists, and that's not accounted for in this description. That is to say there are quantum jumps. And when the system jumps, well, we, that means that we know for sure a photon was emitted, and therefore uh, information was lost. So we now have a more general, we need, what we discussed last time is that we need a more general description of the state of the system, which takes into account the fact that I'm losing track of what the wave function is. And therefore, I can only say that there is some probability 
that the wave function is a particular wave function or state function. Again, this is a different and subtly different notion. Of course, if I have a superposition of, say, the excited and ground state, well, I also don't know whether it's in the ground state or excited state. However, I, if I have a full knowledge of, this, of the state, then I know what the probability amplitudes are. And I would say that there is a coherent superposition around an excited state. What the description that we call a statistical mixture is some combination of quantum uncertainty, which might have to do with coherent superpositions, and classical uncertainty associated with the fact that I just have lost track of what wave function to assign to the system. So there's two kinds of probabilities that kind of get mixed together in this statistical mixture. The notion of, of uh, a ensemble of different quantum states weighted by classical probabilities and then the probability amplitudes that are associated with that quantum state. And the most general state of the system that I would assign to deduce, to, to predict the outcomes of measurements is defined by the statistical mixture, what we call the density operator. And this allows us to account for both classical fluctuations and quantum fluctuations. And these classical fluctuations, interestingly, are coming from a quantum process here. I mean, fundamentally, everything that we, we believe is at some fundamental level, it's quantum. But effective classical fluctuations arise when uh, the system is described in, as an open quantum system. All right. So this is an important piece of formalism that unfortunately doesn't get covered in standard quantum courses, but sure should. I mean, if there, I mean, this is just part of quantum mechanics. It has nothing to do with atomic physics or nuclear physics or atomic physics. This is quantum mechanics. But we use it all the time uh, in, in our, in, in particularly in quantum optics and in uh, the parts of atomic physics related to quantum optics. Okay, so um, the density operator expressed in a basis is sometimes called the density matrix. And the interpretation that we have of the density matrix elements was as follows. Um, the diagonal elements of the density operator. If we look at this operator. Uh, this is not really correct. This is written correctly. Uh, so this is the probability amplitude to be in the state alpha for that particular state vector. So that's what I'm calling C alpha. And this is C alpha, C alpha star, summed over these probabilities. So it's the ensemble average of these, which this, if we just had a single state vector, we would call this the probability to be in the state alpha. But that's the probability to be in the state alpha if the wave function were psi j. But we don't know which psi j it is, so we have to average over all psi j's. So it's an average of all the populations, and we call that the population in state alpha. So probability to find the atom in state alpha. Does everyone understand what this is saying? Why does there sort of two kinds of probabilities here? If we just had a single wave function, this is what we would say. 
the square of the amplitude is the probability to be in that state alpha. But we don't know what the wave function is. And the way we don't know it is a kind of classical not knowing it. So we just have to average this over the possible wave function. But is J now a special angular momentum or can we No, have sorry. It has nothing to do with angular momentum whatsoever. Nothing. It's just, just the change the, in basis. It's just, it, no, no, it's not even the basis. It's just, it's just an index. We don't know which. This is not, J is not an index for the Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. J is not angular momentum. It's just, I have side one, or I have side two, I have side three. I'm not telling you what. It's just, you know, I prepare for you a quantum state. I call it side one. I prepare for you a quantum state called side two. I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to flip a coin. And if the, I'm going to have a three-headed coin. There it is. All right, let's do this. I have a six-sided die. I roll the dice. Oh, it comes up two. I'm going to pair it side two. I'm going to give it to you. Now, if the die was weighted equally, you would say it's one six. Your state, you would decide one six side one, one six side two, one six side. We would decide beforehand what side one and side two and side three up to side six are. Then you would assign your state of the system as a density matrix, which is a statistical mixture of psi 1 through psi 6, weighted by the probabilities that you expected me to send you psi 1 through psi 6. And then when you do a measurement of up or down or excited or ground, you would say, well, each one of those psi 1s through psi 6 had a particular probability to be in the ground state. And then you would average them over the probabilities that the, the die came up 1 through 6. <clears throat> so this index j can be, you know, it could be 1 through a million. It has nothing to do with the dimension of the Hilbert space. It has nothing to do with any momentum. It's just an index that says, the state is a statistical mixture of many, many different possible sides. And that which of the sides appear in that statistical mixture depends on the process which made those states. In this case, it would have to do with all the possible quantum jumps that happen in the system. That's another way that you can statistically prepare a mixture through quantum jumps. A different way is, I come over here with my dice, I make states and I throw them to you. They are the same kinds of statistical missions, but with different weightings of probabilities. Okay? So, um, right, so we have populations. The other thing we have, as we discussed, is the off-add elements of the density matrix. Um, now involve uh, the products of two amplitudes where one is conjugated. This is a particular example of it where alpha equals beta. And if I write this in terms of a complex number with an amplitude and a phase, then what you see is that the off-diagonal matrix elements take into account the relative phase between the probability and amplitudes, but averaged over all the possible members of the ensemble. And one of the things that can happen when you have, as we will discuss more today, when you have a statistical mixture is that this averaging over all possible members of the ensemble can wash, make this, if I average over many different phase differences and all those different phase differences are different for different J's, then the average can make this very small. So the effect of a statistical mixture is quite often to remove coherences. And in some sense, you can think about the reason at the macroscopic level we don't see quantum superpositions is because we have a statistical mixture of different states. 
and that cyclical mixture gets rid of coherence. Now, coherence means interference. Coherence means that the two probability amplitudes can, in principle, interfere. And that is the hallmark of quantum probability, that two alternatives are not just logically distinct, but they can interfere. And if you get rid of quantum interference, you've got, you've, you, you're back to classical probability. So that's a little, just a little food for thought there, that the relationship between uh, quantum coherence and the macroscopic world uh, is related to the existence of loss of information. Okay, so these are some fundamental principles that I just wanted to re-emphasize because they're quite important to really have a deeper understanding of quantum mechanics. But we use them also as a piece of formalism in order to understand the dynamics of atoms controlled by, say, laser light. So what are some of the pieces of formalism that we need? Well, um, so if I have the state, I want to, for example, calculate the expectation value of, of uh, some measurements that we do on some observable. How do I do that? Well, as we showed last time, that expectation value uh, is related to, um, you know, if we had a single state, we would say this was the quantum expectation value. But since we don't have a single state, we have to average over many different states, right? And that average, I mean, if I just had one state, I would just write it as, as this, which is my expectation value, that this is equivalent to um, taking the observable, taking its matrix multiplication with the state, which is now an operator, the density operator, taking that matrix multiplication and then taking the sum of the diagonal matrix elements. The trace of A with rho is equal to the expectation value of A. So that's ultimately how you use the state, for example, to, to determine uh, expectation values. Um, other properties we saw, this is, this, the state is described by the density operator. It's a Hermitian operator. And, uh, if I look at the trace of this matrix, remember the trace of some of the diagonal matrix elements, that's just the sum of these populations. And if it's normalized, that trace is equal to one. Okay. Um, one last thing that I guess I will mention about uh, the density operator that you see here. is the distinction between what we call a pure state and a mixed state. So a pure state is uh, not the same thing, although I should mention, this language is sometimes perverted and used incorrectly. When people talk about mixed states, they s sometimes mean not an energy eigenstate. That's not the proper usage of the term pure and mixed. A pure state is a state described by a single wave function. So in this case, there would be only one possible 
psi in my ensemble. That's a pure state. It's just one psi. It's what we usually call the state of the system. We didn't know anything about the density operator. Those states are all pure states. They could be eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, or they could be superpositions of eigenstates. But they're still, if they're describable by a single wave function, they are pure states. Um, a mixed state is a state where I have uh, PJs different from 1 or 0. As I say, if I have some statistical mixture with multiple size. Now, if I gave you a density matrix and I didn't give you this ensemble decomposition, how would you know whether that was a pure state or a mixed state if I just gave you the operator? Well, you can see that quickly by is if I look at rho squared. If I look at rho squared, well, it's a little bit subtle because these sides that are in the statistical mixture need not be orthogonal. Um, so how am I going to do this without getting too deep into the details? OK. Rho is permission. Therefore, rho can be diagonalized. Uh, in terms of eigenvectors. In this case, this is equal to the dimension of the Hilbert space. So this is the eigenvalues of the density matrix. And these are the eigenvectors. We know a Hermitian matrix can always be diagonalized. We also know this is of this form. Therefore, we can think about rho as a statistical mixture of its eigenvectors, right? This is, it's exactly of this form. So let's look at rho squared. That's the square of the matrix. You just square its eigenvalues. So what can we say about this? If the state is pure, then the trace of rho squared is equal to 1. Why? Because in that case, if I had a pure state, I have only one psi. That psi is the eigenvector, in which case all the eigenvalues are 1 or 0. And there's only one eigenvector with eigenvalue 1. Therefore, lambda squared is 1, and therefore trace of rho squared is 1. Whereas for if it's mixed, the trace of rho squared is less than 1. All right. So, the density operator is a very important piece of formalism in understanding quantum physics. And it's particularly important here in thinking about the uh, evolution of the state in the context of um, spontaneous emission. And what we discussed last time and I'll just quickly review here, is now let's look at the di dynamics uh, of the density matrix. 
So this is a generalization of the Schrodinger equation for the wave function. Now we have a kind of generalization of the Schrodinger equation for the generalization of the state. We have an evolution of the density matrix. And what we find is the following is true. There are two pieces. There's a part that is, looks just like this, the evolution coming from the effect of Hamiltonian. And then there's a piece that has to do with the jumps. If we didn't have to worry about the refeeding of population back into the ground state, this would be a fine description. But in order to account for that, we need another piece here. So we did that. And we found the following equations of motion. The population in the excited state, which is given by the ensemble average of this bilinear combination of the amplitudes was equal to just come from plugging these equations into this. There's no feeding terms here, because feeding only feeds the population going into the ground state. And that feeding term, we can understand in terms of conservation of probability. Any any population uh, that's going into the ground state must be coming from the excited state. So that the sum of the total population is unchanged with time. And according to hermeticity, the other octagonal element that tr is the transpose okay. All right. So these equations uh, determine what we call the master equation. Maybe we may talk a little bit about this more another time. But right now, this is our dynamical evolution of our two-level system where we are driving it, we're detuned, and we have spontaneous emission. So, um, how can we understand that what we want to study in the next in this today and maybe 
to finish our tomorrow, is understanding these dynamics in more detail. In the absence of spontaneous emission, well, we saw what the solution was. We had Bravi oscillations. also understood that in terms of uh, the evolution as a rotation on the block sphere. So if we say started in the ground state, if we were exactly on resonance, then we would get Rabi oscillations. going from the ground state up to the excited state, back to the ground state, and then going through <coughs> some superposition of ground and excited on the equator, right? So, one of the first things though, in order to dispute <coughs> We made this uh, isomorphism between the two-level atom and the spin one-half part, where we thought about the state of the system as a kind of pseudo-spin, where we had a population in spin up and spin down which was isomorphic to a superposition of ground and excited if I made the mapping of spin up to excited and spin down to ground. We want to generalize this picture of the vector on the block sphere, which we call the block vector. We want to connect that now for the case of mixed space. How are we going to do that? What is the block vector? How, if, how can I find it? Well, the block vector is, for a given state, it's the direction of the spin, right? So for the block vector, is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the state. How is that? Well, um, the, if we recall the block vector, a vector which traditionally has components u, d, and w, Right, so this is the x component, this is the y component, the z component of this vector. How can I find those components? Well, this is the amount, if this is, if I call this the x-axis, I'm sorry, the z-axis, this the y-axis, this the x-axis. So x, y, z, this, this is the x's. Okay, This should be like this. this is y. This is x. <coughs> the components of this vector are the components of the spin. So r is equal to the expectation value of the three components of spin. The u is the expectation value of sigma x. The v 
is equal to the expectation value of sigma y. And the w is the expectation value of sigma z. What do these things mean for the atom? Remember, this has nothing to do with the spin of the electron. Nothing. Zero. Nada. It's just a, a mathematical ma mapping of a two-dimensional Hilbert space to another two-dimensional Hilbert space. Okay? So don't get confused. It has nothing to do with the spin of the atom. But it does have something to do with the atom. What does it have to do with the atom? Well, let's, let's take a look. This is equal to, what is sigma x? Well, sigma x is sigma plus plus sigma minus. So this is equal to CE CG star plus CG What about V? V is the expectation of sigma y. Sigma y is equal to sigma plus minus sigma minus uh, sorry, this is <coughs> backwards. Right, that's correct. which is equal to 1 over i c star c g minus c g star c e. And w is equal to the expectation of sigma z. Sigma z is equal to the population in the excited state minus the population in the ground state for the projectors. So, how do we interpret these three components of the block vector? Well, the x and y components of the block vector, which are called u and v, are related to coherence. They are related to the superposition, the phase relationship between the excited and the ground state. If there was no phase relationship between the ground and the excited state, these components would be small. And the W has to do with the population difference. And of course, we know the total population is 1. So the only thing we need to do to specify the population in the ground and the excited state is to know what is the population difference between the ground and the excited state. OK. So if I have a mixed state, well, then the box vector is just this ensemble average over the average of all the different possible state vectors. So we just ensemble average this, and that then becomes rho GE plus rho EG. Or the twice the real part of rho GE. What is U? I mean, V, it's equal to the ensemble average of this thing, which is equal to 1 over I rho GE minus rho EG. Which is equal to twice the imaginary part. And W is equal to 
the difference in the populations, rho e e minus rho g. So these equations for the components of the density matrix can also be written as equations for the three components of the block vector. Because the three components of the block vector are just related to the independent three parameters that specify the state. So often you will see these rewritten in terms of the block vector, in which case these equations are often denoted as the optical block equations. So you'll see that I think it's in the textbook that they're called the optical block equations because they are the block equations for the block vector where the driving is optical. Now, one last thing about the block vector here. If this was a pure state, well then, every state that's a pure state is spin up along some direction, right? Therefore, for a pure state, we know that you spin up has eigenvalue 1, the magnitude of the block vector is 1. It's a pure state. So all of the surface of the sphere of unit radius is some pure state meaning that it is some particular superposition of ground and excited states. The mixed states are ensemble mixtures of different vectors, weighted by probabilities. So the mixed states are inside the ball. And the more mixed, the shorter the block vector. So what happens to the dynamics? We saw Rabi oscillations that were just rotations of the block vector on the block sphere. The magnitude of the block vector remained constant at 1, and we just saw oscillations. Now we add in spontaneous emission. What's going to happen? Well, the first thing that we know is that we're going to lose purity. So the vector is going to move somehow from the surface of the sphere into the ball. Moreover, we also know that the, we have damping, meaning that oscillations don't go on forever. We reach steady state, just like if I had a, a, a harmonic oscillator with friction on it. So the quantum dynamics associated with the driven damped two-level atom look like this. reaching some steady state, an ending. So what we see here is oscillations eventually uh, reaching some final point. There is, as we see in this, some, in steady state, some fraction that's in the ground state and then some fraction that's in the excited state. And we also have, in general, some amount of x and y components of the block vector. Those I didn't necessarily draw it so well. Uh, 
which correspond to some steady state of coherence depending on the relative ratio of these three parameters, the Rabi frequency, the detuning, and the line width. So let us discuss this a little bit more in detail. and there's damping. That damping is just due to spontaneous emission. Now, classically, if I thought about this as a bound, as my atom is being described as a bound charge, bound to the nucleus, as you're studying in your homework right now, I mean, we can understand What's going on if we drive the system with some electric field that's oscillating with some frequency that I'll call the laser frequency, that this will drive oscillations of my charge. And in steady state, the charge has some resonance frequency or maybe not, it will come to some steady state as well. And we will have an induced dipole moment. And that induced dipole moment, if this is a linear harmonic oscillator, will be proportional uh, to the driving field by uh, some constant I'll call alpha twiddle, which is the <coughs> polarizability. It's the dynamical polarizability. We're driving it. We make some dipole. The dipole oscillates, but it has some amplitude that depends on how close this is to resonance and how much damping there is. This is what's called the Lorentz oscillator. A very important model to understand, to understand optical response of materials driven by electromagnetic waves. Now, how do, why do I call this to the low? This thing is generally complex. So let me write alpha tilde as having a real part and an imaginary part. Okay, the complex number. So that means that this thing is really the real part of this. That's really what I should have written. This is Excuse me, the laser is being driven. I mean, the laser has a frequency, omega sub L. This is the frequency which I'm driving the system. And it's important to remember that if you have a driven system in steady state, it oscillates at the frequency of the drive, not the frequency of the resonance. Okay? So, the induced dipole moment here 
is equal to the real part of the complex polarizability times the amplitude e to the minus i. So assuming this is a, there's no there's this is a real vector. Well, when we can take the real part of this, we have the real part of this. imaginary part. So our incident field we've chosen the phase of the incident field so that the incident field oscillates as cosine omega t. Our driven or harmonic oscillator oscillates at that frequency and has a piece that oscillates in phase and a piece that oscillates, as we call this, in quadrature. This is basic simple harmonic oscillator physics. If you have a harmonic oscillator and you drive it at a certain frequency, there's a part of that response that's going to oscillate at, at in phase with the drive and a part that's going to oscillate 90 degrees out of phase. And that part that oscillates 90 degrees out of phase, we call that in quadrature because it's 90 degrees out of phase. So the real and imaginary parts of the polarizability are telling us about how much of the response is in phase, and the imaginary part tells us how much is in quadrature. And as you're studying in your homework right now, what you know is that the real part has to do with the dispersive response, and the imaginary part has to do with absorption. That's to say, the amount of light that's absorbed in, by this uh, oscillating charge depends on how much is oscillating in quadrature. So this is the classical description. What if we have the same kind of thing going on in our two-level atom. We have the same thing. We have electron bound to the nucleus. We're driving it. There is going to be a, oscillating dipole, and that oscillating dipole will eventually come to some steady state because of the stamping. So what we want to do now is relate the, we don't have just the position of the electron, our atom is described by the density matrix or equivalently by the block vector. <coughs> so what we want to relate now is how are the components of the block vector related to the induced dipole moment. Well, So uh, the induced dipole moment that we're talking about as a function of time is the expected value of the dipole operator as a function of time, where that dipole is induced by the driving and therefore comes to steady state with the damping. Well, what is this? This is equal to the expectation that the, the dipole operator is DEG plus DEG. Remember, as we've discussed, 
the dipole operator has no diagonal matrix elements because of parity. It only has octagonal elements. So this is the operator. Um, so if we had uh, a given state here, this would be equal to, if I write this as the state, this is D, E, G, plus complex conjugate. This is equal to C, B, star, C, G. And if we ensemble average this over the ensemble in the mixed state, then this is equal to rho G, B. So the expected value of the dipole operator is equal to um, twice the real part of the dipole matrix element times the element of the density matrix as a function of time. Uh, So the coherences in uh, our two-level system are what are responsible for the dipole. We need superposition of ground and excited in order to have a dipole moment. If we only had ground or we only had excited, well, then neither of those states have dipole moments because they're eigenstates of parity. It's only a superposition of ground and excited that has a dipole moment. And that superposition is changing in time. It's changing in time because we're driving the system. And in fact, we're driving with an oscillating field, so this uh, is um, going to be oscillating with the oscillation of the drive. How do we express that? Well, firstly, let me just choose the state such that I'm going to choose this thing to be real. So I'll get rid of that. So my induced dipole moment in this quantum mechanical description is twice the dipole matrix element times the real part of rho g e as a function of time. Now, what is that? Well, there's one little subtle point here, which I swept under the rug, which was that we went to the rotating frame. We went to the rotating frame, that means we went to the frame that was rotating at the frequency of the drive. That was very deep underneath this moment. So this, either I put that rotating frame into the operator, in the kind of Heisenberg picture, or I put that rotating frame into the state, kind of short of a picture. Uh, the bottom line here is that in the lab frame, the um, relationship between the coherences in the lab frame and in the rotating frame is through this phase factor. That's from the so this is in the rotating frame. G, sorry. Okay, however, we just said that we can relate this um, off diagonal element to the elements of the block vector. So rho g e uh, there's a sign problem here, but I can track it down.
Sorry. Yeah, it must be the case that this is a plus. I have to do that way. All right, so um, let's plug that in. We get twice. And we just describe the block vector. Is it still standing here? No, it's not in there anymore. The u, this was u plus i v. The real part of this we call the u component of the block vector. The imaginary part v over 2. Uh, this is then equal to U times cosine plus V or minus V. Well, I have to call that as V. So what we've learned from, from this is that our um, response of our two-level atom looks somewhat like the response of a harmonic oscillator, where we have a piece of that response that is uh, in phase with the drive, and a piece of that response that is in quadrature with the drive. And the amount by which I'm in phase and in quadrature depend on how much coherence I have driven. And that coherence is generally a complex number. It has a real part and an imaginary part. Now, I should say, of course, as a time-dependent thing, these u and v's are generally time-dependent quantities. Right? The coherences are going to generally vary as a function of time. And they'll vary as a function of time, like the Robbie frequency or something like that. It's only perhaps in steady state that they become constants. The atom is not a harmonic oscillator. The atom is uh, this more general quantum uh, bound set of charges. But, as we'll see, there is a regime where I can think about that atom very, very close to the harmonic oscillator. And its response is essentially the same as that of the harmonic oscillator. So, let's now, well, what are we, I guess, uh, let's solve now this problem in terms of the steady state. All right, what, are, what can we say here? Well, so let's remind ourselves of the optical block equations. In particular, let's look at the equation for my off-diagonal matrix element, my coherence in the rotating frame.
That was the equation we had. Um, let's look at this in steady state. So after the transients have died down, just like our driven charge on the spring, we know that the dipole should oscillate like, the fre like with the frequency of the drive, and we want to know how much dipole we have made, how much we have made in terms of part that's in phase and a part that's in quadrature. So in steady state, Uh, there's no more change. It's in steady state. So now we can solve this equation for the steady state. In steady state is equal to uh, minus i omega over 2 i gamma times rho gg minus rho g. Okay, we, these are the steady state values of the population difference. So let's look at this response. First, consider perturbative case. where the ground state population has not changed by almost anything at all. Of course, we are going to get some absorption. We're going to get some small reduction in the ground state population. But that amount is going to depend on the field amplitude or intensity. And this coherence is already first order in the field and amplitude. So for very weak fields, we'll, we'll justify this later. So we're going to look at the case where we just put on a very weak field, or a field that is detuned so far from resonance that almost no population leaves the ground state. We'll come back to understand the conditions for which that's true in a moment. In that case, my off diagonal coherence in the rotating frame is approximately equal to omega over 2 uh, times minus delta uh, minus or plus i gamma over 2. All right. So, and this was equal to u plus i v over 2. Um, all right. So, what can we say about this? What is the nature of this function? This function is what we call a complex Lorentzian. It's a familiar function. Let's look at its real and imaginary parts. So here, u is equal to omega over 2. minus delta over delta squared plus gamma squared over 4. That's just multiplying top and bottom by complex conjugate. V is equal to minus uh, omega over 2 times gamma over 2 delta squared plus gamma squared. Okay, let's go back over here to our induced dipole moment.
I'm just going to put this back inside here. This is then u. I think the conjugate is heavy. Because, why did I do that? Well, this, let's plug this back in over here. This is equal to DEG. The Rabi frequency is DEG dot into the electric field over H bar. We have a factor of two. We have a minus delta plus I gamma over two. So, what do we see here? Well, all of this induced stifle moment stuff then is some complex polarizability for the atom times the amplitude of the field. What is that complex polarizability? Well, we see it here. Two level atom polarizability. Alpha. It's equal to the square of the dipole matrix element divided by uh, H bar minus sorry minus two uh, these damn minus signs I don't know if they drive you crazy equals square over two H bar minus delta. Plus I down over two delta squared. This is the point I really wanted to get to. And let me explain what's going on here. What we see here now is just like our classical simple harmonic oscillator. When we look at the driven two-level atom, if that driving is weak so that we can do perturbation theory, then the induced dipole moment is linearly proportional to the strength of the field. It's linear response. And the proportionality constant is the atomic polarizability, which has a real part and an imaginary part. Let's quickly sketch these functions. The real part of the polarizability as a function of the D2D. How does it look? Well, when delta is very, very, very small compared to gamma, it just goes like minus delta. So it looks like a line that goes through the origin. And when delta is very, very big compared to gamma, well, then it falls off like 1 over delta. So it looks like the imaginary part of the polarizability.
What does it look like? Well, when delta is very small, it's some constant that depends on gamma. And when delta is very big, it falls off like 1 over delta squared. So it looks like that. This is supposed to go to 0. That goes algebraically to 0. 1 over delta squared. This goes like 1 over delta. This is a Lorentzian. And the full width at half maximum is equal to gamma. Yeah. This, of course, is the familiar absorption and dispersion line shape of a harmonic oscillator. Our response of our two-level atom was just the response of a harmonic oscillator in the perturbative case. When we did not move much population out of the ground state. And what we see here is the amount by which I absorb, because remember we said the in quadrature component, which was the B component, and this is the U component. The amount of absorption depends on the line width. So again, we think about this as the excited state has some spectral distribution, such that if I tune my laser frequency right to the center, I get maximum absorption. And the amount of absorption falls off, like 1 over delta squared, once I start getting outside of this line. So that the effect of damping is to broaden the line. And the amount of line width, that is to say, the amount of spread of frequencies by which I absorb depends on 1 over the length of time. So this is one manifestation of what we were talking about earlier, that when you have a finite lifetime, when the system decays, you end up with an effective spread of energies associated with that excited state. That's one way to understand this manifestation of the time energy uncertainty principle. So we'll conclude there, but let me just highlight just a, a few things. What we've learned here is that when we have the damp driven heart atom, there's if we're in the perturbative regime, then it looks just like a harmonic oscillator. But we want to also talk about and we'll do that on Monday, is the notion of population. This was about coherences. But what about the populations? The population, the ground state, the population, etc. Right now I just said, well, they're not changing. In the perturbative regime, that's a reasonable uh, first order in E. In the electric field, that's fine. But now we want to go on to think about this more generally, and finally relate these coherent dynamics with damping to the dynamics that we described at the beginning by Fermi's Golden Rule, and make that handshake between Fermi's Golden Rule and the master equation. So we'll do that on Monday. All right.